I just love how weird they are and they're totally okay with it. Like that, my heart is just, the, they're, they're so weird and beautiful. <laughs> they're cool. And they kids. haven't had anyone tell them they're that's wrong yet. And it's like, please stay this way forever. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I have the great fortune to speak with and share the stories and wisdom of musicians and leaders in the band community. The Everything Band podcast is a proud member of the Music Teachers Development Podcast Network. The Muted Network provides support in the form of audio on-demand programming designed by and for music educators. You can find more information about our network at mutedpodcasts.com. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I really appreciate your time and hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you know one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, help your students live up to the best that is in them through music. And now on to my next guest, Caitlin Bove. Hi, Caitlin. Hello. How did I do with your name? Pretty good. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, Caitlin, could you introduce yourself to the listeners and tell everyone why you're on the show? Yeah. So um, I'm currently a doctoral student at University of Kentucky. I'm working on my uh, doctorate of musical arts in wind conducting, and I'm graduating this spring in uh, spring 2019. Before then, I taught high school and junior high uh, public school music in Utah, And I'm originally from California, and I did my bachelor's and master's in music ed at University of the Pacific in Stockton, California. The University of the Pacific in Stockton. We have, um, I'm just going to give a plug for the Muse Ed, one of my fellow podcasts on the Muted Podcast Network. Um, You know those hosts as well, so I'm just going to give them a free plug here. Yep, I'm friends with all of them. They're great people. So go listen to their show too, everybody. Okay. Anyway, Caitlin, back to you. So Caitlin, can you tell me the story of how you got into music your early years? And maybe did you have any family that sort of pushed you into music? Um, So from doing genealogy, I've found that I have a bunch of family members I've never met who were musicians. Um, But in my immediate family, nobody was. And I was the, the oldest. So growing up, there'd be little musical toys in my house. And my mom tells stories about how I knew like how to sing Beach Boys songs when I was two and a half and um, how I could take little toy pianos and figure out melodies on my own as like a toddler. And so she was like, hey, you're you seem like maybe a musician. So she puts me in um, elementary band in fourth grade and she picked flute for me because she thought that would be the least annoying instrument to hear practiced in the house. And I remember wanting to play the violin, but I guess I was uh, I was a year too late because they started violin in third grade. So I ended up on flute and um, fourth grade. I was no good. Uh, I just did what they told me to do and, and I guess tried. And then I went home for the summer and they didn't tell us to practice over the summer. And I didn't know any better because there were no musicians in my life. So it's like, oh, it's summer. It's time to play outside. Stick your flute under your bed. And then fifth grade, uh, we came back for year two band. And there, I don't remember there being any review or checking in whether or not you still knew how to play your instrument. So by fifth grade, I'd completely forgotten how to play. And I just held my flute and faked it the entire year and nobody stopped me. Um, so that was a pretty rough year. Uh, and then following that, we moved on to middle school and starting in sixth grade, um, we could take electives during the school day. And so band was an option. And I'm not sure why I chose to sign up for band because at that point, I really did not know how to play my instrument anymore. But I, I didn't know that there was a concept you could just quit things that you had already started doing. Uh, my parents didn't ever let us quit anything. So I signed up for band again. And I was placed in the middle school remedial band, which was where you went if you didn't know how to play your instrument. And um, my my band director at Stanley Middle School, uh, his name's Bob Athade. He's still there. Uh, he was amazing. And from the first day, I just walked into that classroom and it was the most fun experience. Band was like the best time. Everything that I was doing wrong, we fixed 
all the stuff I missed in fourth and fifth grade, I got caught up on. Um, and just that first year, I just had a fantastic time and uh, moved on through seventh and eighth grade and just played a ton in the middle school. I picked up trumpet so I could play in the jazz band. Um, I ended up you know, practicing enough so I could get in the top groups. And we had a lot of really fun, awesome opportunities. There was a flute choir. There were after school, like jazz improv and music theory classes given by local area um, people. This was in Lafayette, California, where I'm from. And I remember thinking to myself, this is so fun. How could I have this much fun every day for the rest of my life? Oh, I could be that guy. I could be my band director. I could, I could go out and I could become a music educator. So I decided when I was 12, that I wanted to be a, a band director because then I could have that much fun all day. And more importantly, um, I could pick the music that we got to play in class because I thought that would be really fun too. So I decided that in um, middle school. <laughs> and so when I went to high school, I kept playing flute, I kept playing trumpet. Um, I gave some music lessons to local um, kids. I did some conducting at the high school. I was the pep band conductor. So that was my first experience conducting. I got told I looked like John Philip Sousa because I kind of flapped my elbows around very stiffly when I conducted uh, the, the high school pep band. Um, our high school program was really supportive of um, concert band and uh, the jazz band program. We were like always going on tour. I remember my junior year of, of high school, we got to go perform in Australia and play in the Sydney Opera House. And so again, it was just all these experiences of, oh, this is where music can take me. I just want to keep doing this. And my parents were kind of like, hey, you get really good grades in science and math. Do you want to go, you know, maybe be an engineer or a biology major or do something that you could potentially make a lot of money doing. And I was just like, nope, I do not want to. I just want to be a music teacher. Please, thank you. And so they were really supportive once they decided that's, they knew that's what I want to do. So whatever I needed lesson wise or um, equipment wise or just different opportunities, they were very supportive of me there. So I appreciated that a lot. And then I went to University of the Pacific and majored in music education and got my first job after that. I want to talk a little bit about the four, your fourth and fifth grade experience. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a, not a, not a dissimilar experience from yours. I, I wasn't very good as an elementary school musician. And, um, I don't know if I was so enthused about it in those days, but I find myself currently in a job where I'm teaching fourth grade band, mm -hmm. I'm teaching beginners in fourth grade. And I'm, I'm thinking about my kids and the kids I'm teaching. Do you have any thoughts about what may have not connected with you? Yeah, I think um, there was a lack in that particular program of personal attention. Like, I don't remember ever being called out on not playing or not being able to play. And I don't mean in a way to embarrass, but I just mean, you know, checking in. It's not always about, you know, the tutti ensemble playing. So when I got to teaching, because I eventually taught uh, junior high and we started them in seventh grade. And so I was going through the same method book that I went as a fourth grader with new seventh graders who were beginners, obviously just going through it faster and doing other supplemental, um, other supplemental activities as well. But, um, you know, what I really put forth from day one was let's get you playing as a group, but let's also get you playing in your sections. Let's get you playing as individuals. Let's reward little soloists. Like if, if you can play the solo solely line out of, you know, the standard of excellence book, um, let's make that a big thing and, and celebrate that. Um, let's do improv improvising and a little bit of, you know, easy major scale kind of jazz improvising in the very first year to get kids encouraged to play on their own and really enjoy playing. Because that's another thing is when you go home over the summer and you don't have that band experience anymore, um, you have to have a love and an understanding of your instrument as an individual uh, in order to keep that going when you don't have the full ex ensemble experience. And the other thing that I really thought about doing um, differently than what I had in my own experience is to try and understand you know, where they're coming from in their musical life up to that point, the kind of music that they like listening to, the kind of music that they're seeking out is usually not what they're finding in a beginning band book and not what's necessarily available uh, for purchase with the music publishers in a grade one, grade one and a half, grade two. 
Um, so I would try to supplement by arranging little easy tunes for them. Once a week, I would have them call out, you know, a radio song that they might like to listen to. And we'd either learn it by rote or the older kids, we would learn how to write it down. So we were transcribing radio tunes in B flat major um, just so that they were gaining an understanding and a, a passion and desire to play their instrument on their own and learning ways that they could do that, that would be a little more applicable to their life outside of band. So, Caitlin, back to your sort of personal history, what was your experience like at the University of Pacific and how did that prepare you as a music teacher for your first job? Yeah, um, I really loved my experience there. We were in classrooms doing observations and a little bit of assistant teaching, just depending on um, the, the, the teacher we might have been working with um, from the first semester of freshman year. So I, when I hear horror stories about people who got all the way up to their student teaching, their final semester, did the student teaching and realized, oh, being a music teacher isn't for me. I just, you know, wasted this bachelor's degree. Like that terrifies me. But I also know that I had the opposite experience that we had just so much opportunity right off the bat at University of Pacific to be engaged, to work hands-on in the classroom and local public schools. Um, a lot of the public school teachers were alums, but even the ones that weren't alums too, like everyone was just very welcoming of us, very supportive of us. If we'd come in and be like, hey, can I run a sectional? Can I do this? Can I do that? Can I sit in with your ensemble? And can I play cello with your orchestra today? Everyone was just super positive, super happy we were there. And that made a huge difference um, in terms of my confidence level, um, what I felt like I was able to do, the things that I got practice to do um, before I ever went into student teaching. So by that point, I just felt like student teaching was a piece of cake. Like I had a really good time and just was very, very well prepared for that. Um, at the university, our, our, our classes and our teachers, um, that was all fantastic too. We had really small class size. It's a liberal arts school about I'm not sure what it is about now, but when I went, it was about 3000 undergrad. Um, so really small classes at the conservatory between 100 and 200 kids um, in in the conservatory uh, when I was there. And um, so just a lot of personal attention there. They wouldn't let you get away with anything if you tried to slack off. Um, so just built up really good work ethic there. Uh, the only thing I didn't get from my experience at University of the Pacific was marching band because we did not have a marching band there, but we were encouraged to go out and work in the fall with the local high school so that we could gain that experience. There are opportunities to learn marching band, even without a marching band program at the school, even without a football team. Right. And we talked about that in our band development class. And so we definitely were given a basis of from somewhere to start. The other thing I really liked about my experience there is our band director, um, Dr. Eric Hammer, he ran our bands very much in an educationally sound foundation so that when we were rehearsing um, as a college group, and we were a really great group, we did a lot of high quality, complex, challenging music, but he would teach it in a way that we always knew why we were doing something. We always knew why we were rehearsing in a certain way or how the thing that we were doing was going to improve us as a group. He had us sing a lot. He had us switch music with each other, different instruments, so we could look at each other's parts. He'd have randomly students come up and conduct from the ensemble, especially if he knew they were in the conducting class during that semester, so that we got an opportunity just out of the blue <laughs> to get a little bit of conducting, but also it opens up the eyes and the ears of the members of the ensemble. And so I've always appreciated the way that he ran that group because every rehearsal as a band member was also just like observing this master teacher and gaining all these awesome skills that I can use as, as rehearsing with any younger group in the future too. I want to ask you, as I think about listening to what you were saying about your experiences at UOP and then thinking about what I'm doing now, how can teachers, when we're in our classrooms as band directors or music teachers, how can we use the, the local universities or the local colleges to help them to help? I'm sorry, to help ourselves as teachers. Great. Um, I would just say that, you know, we tend to focus in on whatever it is that we're doing and prioritize what's immediately in front of us. So whether that's, you know, oh, this festival coming up and I've got a program and I've got this meeting to attend and these kids are doing this, whatever. And we leave off the list 
the different things that could be making our lives easier, but also our programs more rich and fulfilling. And one of those things I think are the resources at the, the local university. So um, one thing I think that's important is to try and get a hold of your local university's uh, concert program for the year and see if you can maybe in the spring after insanity of a festival or assessment has died down, but maybe schedule a field trip for your students one night, you know, get, get a school bus and, and meet at the school and, and head over and um, go see one of their concert performances. Cause that also helps your, your kids see like where to go next. You know, once I graduate from the middle school and then the high school, what could I be doing at the college level? These are what students are doing. And it's one thing to tell your students about, oh, there's this concert happening at the local college, but to actually make it a trip and make it fun. And maybe you guys grab dinner first and then you head to the concert and they get to meet the, the director as a group and you know, they're representing your school. They're not just there as a, as a single student who randomly showed up in the audience. I think that can be a really positive experience for, for students um, at the middle school and high school level. Also inviting um, the, the faculty and the students out to your school. Um, you, there may, you know, that school may have lists in terms of the education department about what schools they tend to work with when they're sending student teachers or they're sending people to observe. And for whatever reason, you may or may not be on that list and it could just be an oversight. Um, but if you want students coming out to observe or to work with you, just shooting an email um, and, and asking and inviting um, from the program and saying, hey, we would love kids to come out. Here's my schedule. I would love people coming out to observe. I'd love people coming out to help with sectionals or this, that, the other, or I'm looking for a tech. Um, and then same thing goes with the band director. I mean, again, the, the that college director is as busy as you are, but, but part of their job and part of their um, big thing at the college level is recruitment. And so knowing that you have an interest in them coming to visit you, that just kind of puts you up at the top of their list. Um, I know when I was teaching um, in Utah, um, Tom Keck, who is uh, the band director at Utah Valley University, uh, the year he got there, he sent out an email blast kind of just to all the local um, band directors introducing himself and then saying, hey, if you ever want to um, have me come out and do just like a quick, quick clinic or whatever. And that like, wasn't even on my radar because I was just so stressed. And so just getting everything done to maintain my program the whole time. But, but when he sent that email, I was like, yeah, of course, sure. Please come. And we had such a great, awesome experience. And now he and our friends like years later, just because of that one, um, that one opportunity. So just not feeling, um, like you're too busy or they're too busy, just asking for that help or asking for that visit, I think is super valuable, um, both for you as a professional and then for your students. Caitlin, how did you end up going from Stockton to Utah? I was, uh, finishing up at, uh, University of Pacific and, um, I was dating a guy who had grown up locally, but he was, uh, doing his, um, bachelor's at BYU. So we wanted to, we were, you know, going on the route of, we were going to be getting married. And so I moved out there, um, so we could continue dating and I got my job out there. We eventually got married. And so I was out there for, uh, eight years. Um, but eventually just lots of different life things happen. And so we ended up getting divorced. And that's when I also decided like, Oh, this is a good time to go back and get my doctorate. <laughs> Yeah, but that's maybe not fun, interesting podcast. <laughs> well, <laughs> but you know what? Every listener on this show has is, is, lives life, so we're good. Right. <laughs> we all know. So, <laughs> um, okay, that turned into be a little more uncomfortable than I had hoped. <laughs> 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 so, Caitlin, can you tell me about that job, though? What was that job like, and, and what did you accomplish there? Um, so, when I uh, went out to Utah, my first job placement was at a tiny little school called Mount Nebo Junior High School, uh, teaching seventh through ninth grade uh, in Payson, Utah, which is south of uh, South Salt Lake in Provo. Um, I was teaching uh, all day band and orchestra. So, my first job out 
thinking I was going to be like, I'm going to be a high school band director eventually. Landed a job teaching junior high, which was also great. I loved them. Um, but, but the orchestra part, I was not prepared for. So, uh, lots of learning those first couple of years and, and lots of, um, getting help from various friends and resources, both in that community and back at university Pacific where I had um, come from. Um, but I did that. And while I was at Mount Nebo, um, I did a early morning jazz program. I also tried to figure out how I could best serve that community of students. So I also had an early morning um, folk band because a lot of those kids are um, descendants of pioneers. And so folk band music is very much part of their heritage. And so we did that. I'd get a lot of um, music printed from a, a website called jbucky.com. And Jay Bucky is this American living in, I think the Ukraine now, he designs these really interesting guitar slash harp instruments. He lives in the Ukraine, but he posts these really awesome tablature and um, notation music of just tons and tons of folk music for various instruments. So you can just pull a band together and there's a guitar part and a violin, a fiddle part and a banjo part. And some of it's in tab and some of it's written out. So it's really easy to read, but I collected a bunch of instruments. At one point we had fiddles and um, uh, accordion, banjo, mandolin. Uh, I had a kid playing a tin can. He was a cello player in the school day, but he just really wanted to play a tin can in our, in our folk band. And, and so we got to do that. Um, and so that was a really cool outlet for those kids. And then I also wanted to engage our Hispanic population because Utah has a pretty large Hispanic population. Um, and so I also established an early morning um, mariachi program. And so that was also something I had to learn from scratch how to do, but there's a lot of resources out there. Hal Leonard has a, a bunch of, um, school age appropriate mariachi music um, that you can purchase for a program. And then there are two um, mariachi instructional uh, books, kind of like a beginning band manual, um, Simplemente Mariachi and uh, Mariachi Mastery. And so we, between those two books and the music, and then I would arrange some pieces and some pieces we could find online printed by uh, various mariachi ensembles. We put a group together like that. So um, that was really cool. We actually had a, a local mariachi singer come out and perform at a few of our concerts with us. Um, so that was really fun because that was something new and a way for some students who really hadn't been engaged in instrumental music up until that point to, to, to come through and um, participate. And um, so I did that for a while and then moved over to the high school. This was Payson High School in Payson. So it was a high school that I was feeding into. Um, and so eventually my position turned into a vertical band position. So I was only teaching band starting at the junior high in the morning and then heading over to the high school in the afternoon. And at the high school, I did uh, the concert band, jazz band. I taught guitar. Also not prepared for that, but I figured that one out. Uh, and I taught AP music theory and then after school marching band. I, th I think it was, a, uh, by the time I, uh, left there, I was at a 1.15 FTE, not counting the marching band. It was a very busy day. <laughs> um, but yeah, so a lot of really fun experiences there. A lot of really cool people that I met, a lot of, um, great things we were able to do in that, in that community. Yeah. And so of course, then you end up in Kentucky getting your yeah. doctorate and now you're on to some some bigger I, I shouldn't say bigger and better because what we do is in middle school no. and high school is just as important just as big just and, big and just as awesome it's funny though because I feel like be, being the middle school teacher like I felt the most like oh my goodness I have all this control over all this stuff that could go terribly wrong like <laughs> I'm responsible for all of these kids and putting the first imprints of music education into their mind. Um, and so, I mean, to me, that job was so important. And then as I moved on to being a high school teacher, and now that I'm moving on to eventually, hopefully landing a college gig here next year, like the way people treat me is, oh, now, now you're important. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like those other jobs were like so important and so valuable. And we just, we don't give our middle school directors enough credit at all. Like they're doing so much, so much. So Caitlin, tell me about 
what you're doing now and especially and we were heard can you tell me about that initiative yeah so that got started because my friends were fighting on the internet <laughs> and they uh, were having a discussion because uh, one of my friends posted his um, program for the school year and another friend highlighted the fact that the program that he had put together for all of his concert bands and his jazz bands um, at his high school uh, were all going to be pieces that were composed by men. And so she was just pointing out like, oh, maybe you could have worked a little harder to find some female composers to include on your season program. And they got in the same fight that you hear every time, which is like, oh, well, if I'm only programming music, that's good music that I like, that it doesn't matter who it's by. And it's just quality rep and this, that, and the other. Um, and they got in this fight. It was a home football game for me at Kentucky. So I wasn't on my phone during the day, but I got home and I was scrolling through and I saw like 150 comments on this Facebook post. And I was like, oh no, what happened? Um, and then the next day we were talking about it. Um, me, uh, I was talking with Adam about it. Adam Collins uh, was the, the original uh, programming post person. And he was saying, oh, well, my feelings got a little bit hurt there that, you know, I kind of felt picked on. And I'm like, well, our other friend, Mary Kate McNally, she, um, you know, she can be pretty aggressive with how she brings up these things that are important. Um, and so maybe that's what you didn't like, you know, you're tone policing a little, but, um, but she really was right in what she was talking about. We should be programming. Um, and his response was, well, if I've tried to find women composers, it's just once I do find someone, if I, you know, their website's hard to navigate or there's not a recording of their piece and I can't buy it. Like it's, it's, I've just had a really hard time. And so that struck me the part about the recording of the piece. Cause I realized too, like, I'm not going to go out of my way and buy a piece of music based on it's like just a title. If I don't know what it sounds like, um, or if there's not a score to see, because, you know, our time with our students is so valuable. We need to make sure that what we're putting in front of them is something that we really believe in and something that's going to do well for them uh, educationally and musically. And so pretty much everything I would say that I have programmed recently, uh, I've listened to a recording first ahead of time if I didn't know it already to verify that that's something that I needed. So I realized, well, that's a big prohibitive issue then. If we're saying, hey, go out there and program um, these underrepresented voices, you know, program more female composers, program more composers of color. But then we're saying, just do it based on us telling you to do that or someone telling you to do that. Do it based on a title. Do it even though you have to go out of your way to hunt down a random person that you know nothing about and nothing about their music. Um, that just puts all these other barriers up that makes quality diversity programming really complicated, really hard to do, and ultimately unsuccessful. Um, you know, I've run into a few situations where I feel like there's sometimes a piece programmed on somebody's concert for the sake of diversity, but maybe it's not the appropriate choice. Um, maybe that piece doesn't work. That piece is too hard or too easy for that group or stylistically there's an issue on the program. And I wonder if we had exposure to more music out there by women and minorities that we could be doing a better job of folding that music into our program where it's not even a big deal anymore, where it doesn't have to be just about um, the diversity factor, where it can actually be about the music, which is what we're all here for. So the whole concept of the recording is if we can get more recordings of music by women and by minorities, then that music becomes increasingly available. That music becomes more accessible and suddenly you can base your opinion on whether or not that piece is going to work for your program, not just on who the composer is, but really what that music sounds like and what it's going to do for your group. So I guess that's just me trying to get my friends to stop fighting and, and create a solution to uh, a problem. But so the three of us got together, uh, me and um, Adam Collins and Mary Kate McNally, and we talked about this idea and we said, well, what if we just start asking composers, women and minority composers for their music 
And then we just find bands that will record that music for them. And then we can put it on all one big website. So anyone who's interested in diversifying the voices that are going on their programs has this resource. And then at the same time, we give that to the composers too, so they can do whatever they want with those recordings. And so three of us talked about that. We all love the idea. We invited on some other people um, into our initiative. So initially this, our opening panel uh, was the three of us I just mentioned, um, Courtney Schneider, Ogechi Ukazu, Cliff Crooms, and Tom Scamboa. And so the seven of us got together and kind of created the policy, built up the website, and we launched back in November. And off the bat, we were like, oh no, what did we do? <laughs> because so many people got back to us immediately um, expressing interest in the project. We've had over 60 composers sign up so far. Um, out of the 60, I think as of today, we have 43 pieces that have been submitted to be recorded. And so these are all pieces of music by composers of band um, that are women or minority. And these pieces either have never been recorded before, or maybe it was just the premiere. A lot of these pieces that the composers are working with, they're only recording right now might be, you know, a parent taping it in a high school gym during a concert with a baby crying in the background. So our goal is to match these pieces that have been submitted with quality ensembles. And we are vetting the ensembles as well. We're asking that they submit us a previous recording of theirs to determine that they indeed um, set a high musical standard for themselves and also have a pretty decent audio setup that whatever they're performing is gonna be played back um, with, with high quality when we do um, post these things. And then we'll be matching the, the, the composer with the ensemble based on the difficulty level of the piece, the instrumentation, um, possibly regionally, if we can get them close by and then they can actually do like an on-site visit would be awesome. And then the ensemble will be recording these pieces for the composers. And so the ensembles are getting a piece of music and a performance out of this. They're getting an opportunity to um, help out a composer who needs a little bit more exposure. And then these composers will um, get a great recording of their music. And also we're going to be hosting their information and that recording on our website. The website's called andweweheard.org. So we don't have any recordings yet, but hopefully by the end of the spring, we should have 20, 30, maybe 40 recordings up. We just got to get on that, that last step, which is the matching the ensemble with the, the piece of music. So that's where we're at with that right now. So let me ask Caitlin, what, what would someone who is a director or a teacher who has a band that they might want to be involved in the project, what do they have to do to become involved? Right. So, um, passively, we eventually will just have recordings up on our website. And so if you're saying to yourself, Hey, you know what? I haven't concentrated on programming diverse composers before you can just go to the website and we are going to show you a bunch of awesome composers and their music. And you'll have a chance to actually listen to the piece. So you can decide if that's good piece is going to work for your program, for your concert set, whatever you're doing. If um, you're a band director with an ensemble and you want to help record that music with us, again, just go onto our website. That's andweweheard.org. And there is a form on there under join us for ensemble directors. And when you click on that, you'll just fill out kind of um, your instrumentation, the difficulty level you generally program. You're going to include um, a concert program that you've done recently, just to give us an idea of what you are used to programming and playing. And then most importantly, that audio recording to show us that um, you have the setup that you can generate a good recording for whatever composer we eventually um, pair you up with. And how that'll work is we'll send you two scores. You get to choose one of them. Once you've chosen that score, we'll um, introduce you to the composer and we'll ask that you take uh, a semester, a school semester to get that piece recorded. So whether that's in a recording session you do during a rehearsal or a separate recording session you wish to schedule, or if you uh, record your concerts and you have um, good quality audio set up to record your concerts and it's a decent live recording, um, then we take that from you once you're done and we get that posted and have a very happy composer. 
Caitlin, I think it's a wonderful project. You know, you and I talked about the idea about these ideas a little bit before I started to record and how, you know, what we, we have to be active and intentional about trying to uh, improve diversity in our field that we can't just be passive allies. We have to be active allies. Yeah. Microsoft had a study come out a few years back where they um, exposed um, school age girls to mentors and professionals, women um, in STEM, the STEM fields. And they gauged the girl's interest in careers in STEM before and after those meetings and before and after that engagement. And then they also had a control group of just girls that, that, that they did not have any kind of intervention. And what they found was that the girls who had been able to engage with women in a, in a STEM field where you don't really typically see a lot of women, um, but women who are successful professionals in that field, um, that the girls who had that engagement were um, about 50% more likely to consider careers in that field um, after having that exposure. And I think that's the same in music. Um, you know, we talk about gendered instruments, um, but we talk about gendered instruments because that's what we see. And so when kids go to choose their instrument, they're kind of choosing gendered instruments because it's been that way. And it's because it's what they've seen up into that point. Um, but then for whatever reason, we don't think that's the same issue when we talk about can or should you be a composer, especially a band music. When we put music in front of a girl in a band program starting, maybe she starts as a sixth grader all the way through high school and every piece we put in front of her has a man's name on it. We're not really telling her that girls can grow up to be composers. And I know, you know, people may disagree with me on that and say like, oh, but girls know that they can do anything they want. And it's true, but there is a hardship and there's a barrier that comes with that. And so a girl going through her high school band experience, seeing only pieces by men and kind of being subtly told subconsciously told that this isn't a woman's profession, if she decides that she wants to do that, she's not only going to have to decide to do that, but then also decide to take on all of the work that she's going to have to do to navigate that field being maybe the only girl in her composition studio, or maybe the only woman that's applying for various you know, grants or prizes or commissions or what have you. And so to be able to show girls from an early age that women are doing this and yes, it's not 50, 50 yet. So I'm not suggesting that we program 50% women all the time, but even just a, you know, one piece per concert or thinking to, if I'm going to program 20 pieces in a season, could I get three this season maybe four next season. And then I can start cycling back to some of the pieces that I like from the previous season and start building up a repertoire of, of music by women. And when I'm saying women here, I, I mean um, minorities as well. Um, it's just e easier to say women every time, but, um, but, but the same, it's the same issue of um, with, with minority composers too, is that, you know, um, racial minority students are growing up only seeing music by white composers for the most part in band and orchestra and choir. Um, and so showing them early on that it's not even an issue, showing them that women are composing and that minorities are composing because we are playing their music shows these students that, hey, if you have an interest in this field, it's possible. Here are other people doing it. Um, the other thing too is showing them that it's something that they could possibly be interested in. I've heard on some various professional like chat threads and things like that, girls who grew up and legitimately thought to themselves like, oh, I just didn't think girls or women were allowed to be composers because I never saw one. And it's, you know, when you're young, when you're 10, 11, 12 years old, like that, you could really think that way. And then when you get to high school, maybe you just, you've stopped thinking about it by then. And so it's not even an issue. You're not even considering being a composer because you were shut down so early. So if we can show 
really young students, you know, wherever you start music, elementary, middle, high school, that minorities and women are writing and here's what their music is, then it gives that younger generation the idea that it's possible and it's something I can do. It's something I'm going to think about doing. And then we get more composition majors who are women and minorities at the bachelor's level. And then we get more at the master's level and then we get more actual composers until eventually it's not an issue where we're having to really think about diverse programming. We're not having to go and seek them out because they're easier to find because they're everywhere. And that's, I think, the goal. People have this idea that we're sort of there's scarcity in the band world or or that we're competing for each other. I'm a living composer. I'm a white male composer. If you play my music, it doesn't mean that Granger is any less important. And if you play the music of, say, Kate Nishimura, it doesn't mean that my music is any less important. We're all we all have a place for our music and there's plenty of performances available. Definitely. And I would say that um, Granger's great, but he's dead. And <laughs> he is, which, which is one of the other problems too, that we face is we have, I, I've said this before on this podcast, but we, we, we're, we're also competing against like this huge canon of literature. I mean, we'll talk about the orchestra world that is dead white males. And then we're trying to take a sliver of that pie and then divide that up. So we're compounding yeah. the issues. If we had played more new music in general, then we have more diversity in general. But that's my own. And we're supporting soapbox. living composers and yes. they can feed themselves. And you can actually have them out to your school program or you can email them. Um, you can't email Granger. And I'm saying this Granger is on my conducting recital. I love Granger. <laughs> of course, but we all do. One, but he's only one piece. And my other two pieces are by living composers. Um, I think we owe it to the history and the heritage of band. I mean, I'm obsessed with John Philip Sousa. I would love to put a Sousa march on every program until the day I die. Um, but I think, especially in the band world with how open we are to new music and how supportive we have been to living composers that we just need to continue doing that and continue no matter the gender or race of a living composer to really continue to support them and to make sure that we do that with our programming so that we can continue to have awesome music and continue to push and evolve the art form. Right. And we can do all of this while serving our kids and being the best teachers we can be. Definitely. So Caitlin, we're kind of running out of time here, but I want to ask you about your dissertation because you're doing a, a transcription of Carolyn Shaw's Partita for Eight Voices. Yes. And I just finished cleaning my parts yesterday. Um, when I set out to figure out my dissertation project, I wanted to do transcription because I thought I would like to contribute to our medium in a way that's really tangible, like a piece of music that someone could play. Um, and I wanted to do a transcription by a living female composer because one, I thought that'd be cool. And two, I knew I'd have to interview her. So I was like, this is a great way to meet some, some cool person. Um, and then my third thought was, well, if I transcribe her piece for band and she's never done a piece for band before and she likes it, maybe she will be open to writing for band in the future. And so I, those were kind of the thoughts I had going into it. And I just did, started doing a lot of listening and weeks and weeks of listening. And it'd be like, I hate this piece and I like that piece. Okay. And this will go on my short list and kept listening until finally, um, I found, and I should say I found for myself, but it's a Pulitzer prize winning piece. So it's not like it's hard to find. Um, I found Carolyn Shaw's 2013 Pulitzer prize winning piece partita for eight voices that she wrote for her vocal ensemble room full of teeth. Um, and the minute I put it on, I was like, yep, this is it. I, I stopped looking at that point. Um, I can't believe I hadn't heard it until I started seeking it out, but Oh my gosh, this piece is just incredible. And if you have not heard the original, you should go listen to it right now. It's on YouTube. You can go find it and then you can go buy it on iTunes and support Carolyn and support room full of teeth. Um, but so I decided I wanted to do that piece and I emailed her and I said, will you let me transcribe this for band? Uh, just very out of the blue, probably not very professionally. I didn't know what to do. I was just 
shooting her an email. And within like two days, I got a response. And Carolyn basically said, you know, I've never uh, wanted to transcribe this piece yet. I've been very protective of it. But now that you say band, I'm realizing that, yeah, it's it's a band piece. It's very, you know, wind instrument affected. Um, so I think I'm really interested in what you would do. And so she gave me permission and I have probably listened to it um, maybe 10,000 times to this point. Um, but every time I've been listening is taking all this because the whole piece is based off of just these interesting vocal techniques that are non-traditional, non-standard. Um, there's a lot of ethnic vocal techniques from around the world. You've got Tuvan throat singing, Inuit throat singing. Um, you've got a few different techniques that Roomful of Teeth or Carolyn specifically have made up for this piece. And so to take those sounds, because it's, it's a very much of a sound piece, there are very few lyrics and the majority of the lyrics that are in the piece are spoken rather than sung. And so really it's all about the timbre and the texture and the sounds. And so I was just having to listen to that and just close my eyes and get myself into a dark room and figure, okay, if this was a band instrument or, or just a wind instrument, because I do have some stuff in there that really aren't band instruments at this point, um, what would it be and how would it be played? So I spent the last year and a half doing that and I just finished and we're about to do a reading session in the next couple of weeks. And so I'm sure there'll be edits and changes to it at that point, but um, I'm really excited and kind of freaked out. There's some weird instrument techniques and combinations I'm expecting people to do. We're going to have um, polyphonics happening in the brass. There's going to be like when they sing and play at the same time, there's going to be a, uh, some saxophone multiphonics. I'm still trying to determine good fingerings for the sound that I'm going for. Um, at one point I've got jaw harps in it. So I had to order some jaw harps. There's going to be terracotta pots, which is kind of a little nod to, um, Carolyn Shaw's, uh, percussion ensemble piece taxidermy. Um, so I try to incorporate that, but it also gives us this interesting, unique sound that uh, still fits within the percussion realm. It's just not something you'd normally have on a band concert. And so, yeah, I'm really excited. It sounds cool. What grade level is it? It'll probably be like a five. Um, it's definitely uh, I've got I've got right now um, contra bassoon, contra bass, clarinet, I've got bass flute and stuff like that. So I would say that probably attainable by college with the access to like those, um, ex, you know, ex auxiliary instruments, if you will. Um, but the, the music itself isn't that challenging. It's just going to be the fitting together and the um, extended technique. Yeah, sure. Sure. It's a cool project. You know, I was, I, I was thinking, I forgot to ask you after you had brought it up and you mentioned early when we were talking about, um, uh, the and we were heard. You talked about um, gender specific instruments. Yeah. <laughs> do you know? Do you know the International Women's Brass Conference? Yes. The, there's an interview. There are two interviews that Joanna Hersey did, and I know you're a podcast person mm -hmm. on the Brass Junkies podcast. Okay. And episodes sixty and sixty six, and she talks about women in brass instruments. It's a fascinating discussion. Cool. I just want to throw that out there for the listener. Thank you. And another podcast, the, the Brass Junkies. Andrew Hitz does that in the Entrepreneur Musician, and he's not part of our network, but he's a good guy and a good podcaster. And so, great. All right, Caitlin. So, where do you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition in music? I don't like competition in music. <laughs> Um, trophies are boring. I got them when I did the high school marching band thing. And that was part of the reason I chose not to continue teaching high school anymore. Cause I was like, I, why do I feel dead inside? Isn't this trophy supposed to make me feel good? Um, I don't like it. I think if it, if you need a trophy at the end of the event to, to motivate you, I guess, to do your best, like, great. That works for you. That does not work for me. I don't like it. <laughs> okay, no, that's fair. All right, Caitlin, how do you find work-life balance in a career as a musician and music teacher? Um, I think I probably have and always will do too much, but I think most of us do. I will say that being okay with learning to say no, and that's 
harder to do, I think, when you first start out and you feel like you do owe it to everybody to do everything they ask. But just knowing that there will always be more asked of you than you could ever possibly do. So being aware that you do have to say no and then learning, I guess, where that boundary is for you about where you can function and do a good job and put your all into the things that you do agree to do. And then to also be aware that while everybody loves you, um, that you are the only person that really knows your own boundaries and your own health and your own happiness. And so being able to define that for yourself and to not feel bad about saying no in order to keep your health or to keep your relationships or to keep, um, you know, your work quality where you want it to be. And for that not to feel like an icky thing, even though it will at the beginning, because you, because everybody's a band director because they want to be a helpful person. And so we all just want to say yes all the time, but just know that you'll, you'll be the the best you by learning to say no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for saying yes to the podcast. Of course. <laughs> so Caitlin, this is a big question and the answers run the gamut. Mm-hmm. What are the challenges facing music education and band and how can we best meet them? Um, relevancy. I think where in, you know, band is pretty well attached at this point with education in school, um, you know, beyond there's a couple professional bands and community and lots of community bands in, in the country, but you know, we're not like orchestra where there's just tons of professional orchestras and that's the goal for coming up through school. The goal for school band is school band for the most part. Um, and as schools shift and as school priorities shift and, um, you know, we focus on testing and assessment and common core and changing up everything. Um, I'm, I'm worried that band is getting a little lost because it doesn't fit into the molds that other subjects are. So being able to be better advocates for ourselves um, about what music is all about and why we have music in school and how it's not supposed to do the same things for students as your English, your history, your math, your science classes. Um, but then also relevancy to the modern student. Um, we teach band in a lot of ways, the same way we did in the 1950s, which worked really well in the 1950s. Um, but our students are not the same as the students were in the 1950s. And so if we're not assessing and we're not, if we're telling ourselves it's always worked this way, it will continue to work that way. I think we're doing a big disservice to the relevancy of the modern students. Um, There's a lot of technology that's come out now. We are all attached to technology. The students are attached to technology. Can we use that or can we filter that in a way that makes band more relevant and and accessible um, to today's students. What do they need out of the pro, your band program that maybe a student from the 1950s did not need and vice versa? And seeing if we're, we can be okay with and comfortable with and confident enough in ourselves and our abilities to shake things up and to break the mold of how we were trained and how we've seen others train um, in a band program in order to best fill the needs of the students that we actually have in our classroom today. Caitlin, what advice would you give your younger self? If you can go back to your high school graduation and talk to yourself, what would you tell, what would you tell yourself? Um, I would try not, I would tell myself, you know, to keep, I would do very little different. I'm very happy with where I am now. Um, but in terms of not operating in a bubble so much, I think it's really easy for us to just kind of view our own program like in a microscope and just pick it apart and spend all of our time thinking about just our classes and just our students and what do we need to do to shape that all on our own. And I think looking back, if I had asked for more help, if I had established some 
different methods that I could have had more people coming in to work with my students, or if I had prioritized um, myself going to more conferences or or conducting symposiums, being able to go out and meet more people, not just like locally where I was teaching, but on the national level too. I'm really enjoying doing that now, but I'm very late to the game. I've only been able to hit some of these national conferences and conducting symposiums and things like that um, more recently. And I think part of that, why I didn't do that earlier um, is also because it's scary because when you're asking people for help and you're inviting them in, then, then they, then they see you and they see what you're doing. Um, and it's scary to maybe feel like, am I going to be judged for how my program is? Am I going to be judged for the way I'm running things or the things I'm asking for help for? And then when you go out and you are going to national conferences, you're going to national symposiums, it's scary because, okay, am I going to be judged for my skills here? And so it, sometimes it's just easier if we just like micro focus in on ourselves and our program and we just do the best we can there. But I think it's better in the long run if you allow yourself to be more open and to know that, you know, you're just, you're doing the best you can and that having more help from more places will make that even better. It's definitely the hardest thing is that idea of bringing someone in to see your weaknesses. That's exactly how I feel about it too. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I just, I mentioned to you that I'm back teaching fourth grade. I never taught that. I taught high school. Then I got my doctorate in composition and I went and taught theory. And so I, you know, I, I have the skills to teach fourth grade, but I haven't taught it. So it's really unsettling to me to go back yeah. With a lot of teaching experience and yet be a new teacher at that thing. I totally and, hear you. And so it, part of me is like, boy, I really need to bring people in, but it's like, oh no, but I know these people as a college professor, you know what I mean? I've got like preconceived yeah. notions and, but, um, you know that you have to get over that because it's for the, for my good and for the good of the kids I'm teaching, Definitely. you know, you got to sort of put your ego aside a little bit and get better. Yeah. Got my guest in episode six or eight, the euphonium player, Demandre Thurman. That's one of his sayings is you can't let your ego get in the way of progress. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah. Okay. So if you had a choice, Caitlin, and I don't mean this to be morbid, I mean this to be what has. Oh, I'm super morbid. So we're good. Okay. okay well, then we can go that way. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you had a choice, what would be the final work for wind ensemble or band that you would conduct and why? The Frozen Cathedral. Um, I have this joke with my students when I'm working with them. I'll stop, stop conducting them sometimes to try and help them develop um, like in, in independence that they could be able to, you know, can we maintain the speed? Can you continue this piece without a conductor, blah, blah, blah. And my joke to them was always, well, what if we're in the concert and I die up on the podium? Uh, you got to be able to finish this piece. And their response would always be, well, but shouldn't we stop and get you help? And I say, no, I'm already dead. You, that's my dying wish <laughs> that you finish the piece. So, um, what, you know, whether or not that's actually what happens, the piece would be the frozen cathedral because that piece, oh my goodness. I like cry every time. Not only I play it, but listen to it. I can't get through it without crying. It's so beautiful. It's so hopeful. It's so pretty. Um, John Mackey and I are, are good friends and he was, uh, he did a residency here last year where we got to play that piece with him there in the audience and also had worked up, um, through rehearsals on it. And I love the story behind it. It's just, it's everything I love about band is that piece. And it's super loud too at the end. So I'm all about that as well. Is there anything coming up that you would like to share or promote? Um, so again, our website and we were heard.org. If you want to head over there, we don't have a lot of usable content yet, but, um, that will be coming out this spring. And if you want to help participate, um, come check that out and sign up. Um, and my recital with, uh, the world premiere of the band transcription of Carolyn Shaw's Partita for eight voices, which may have a possible title tweak at that point, since it won't be for eight voices, it will be for a very large wind ensemble. Um, but that recital will be uh, March 5th, 2019, and I'll be live streaming that on Facebook probably if anyone wants to check that out. Cool. Caitlin, how can people get in touch with you? Um, I have a little website. It's just caitlinbovemusic.com, um, or you could email me 
caitlin.may.bobe at gmail.com. Excellent. Caitlin, thank you so much for your time. Of course. Thank you. 